Welcome, welcome to our next colloquium on celebration of faculty careers. And as uh, many of you have heard me say it before, this is a new uh, program that we started this year. We piloted last year, and uh, we started this year, and actually we're down to the last three of our colloquia this week. And so uh, this is for senior faculty, namely full professors, to talk about their career, share their views with all of you, and uh, also take the opportunity to plan for the next seven years. The idea is that every full professor in the college, after they become a full professor, every seven years they get to do one of these. And so today, we have the distinct pleasure of having Professor Fabio Ribeiro, who is going to uh, give his talk. <coughs> and uh, as usual, I will not do a long introduction. Uh, many of you who were there a few weeks ago, he was recognized by receiving the College of Engineering uh, Research Award. And, uh, but he is the R. Norris and Eleanor Shreve Professor of Chemical Engineering. And just to put it on the record, he has been a full professor so, since 2006, and therefore he qualifies. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Professor Ribeiro. Yeah, we dim the lights here. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dean Jamison, uh, Dean Cochini, and uh, our head, Professor Varma, for this uh, opportunity, uh, and also uh, our sponsors that uh, you can see on the on the screen. Uh, it's uh, indeed a time to uh, to uh, give thanks. Uh, I have never given uh, what they call this uh, celebratory talk uh, before. I'll see how it goes. But um, I'm supposed to tell you about uh, my career. Uh, and uh, I was thinking about that. And uh, you, you know, for us, if, if, you know, uh, if you know me and uh, all our colleagues, uh, research is, uh, is very important. And then you would think that, well, the, what you should concentrate on is on the uh, uh, research uh, side. But I found out that really my, the largest contribution that I have that I believe is uh, with the students. So of course there is uh, all the research that we are very uh, focused on that, we spend a lot of time on that, but this is I think the uh, uh, energy that we put on, on the research, it's just an enabler to help to teach the students that that's the way that uh, they should be doing things. And in fact, if we, I look back in our, my career, usually five years after we've done some research, we look it back and say, oh that was so bad five years ago, now we are much better. But the students, no, the students, they came, they, they, they learned. And uh, also, not only students, but uh, I found out that being at the position that we are, we can help lots of people, people in industry, staff, and uh, so I think this is really the, uh, the, the celebration here is not, of course, on my career, but on the career of the, of the students. So um, uh, with that, I would like to, uh, to uh, start with a, a, a light note. You may, may uh, wonder why is that uh, you know, my wife and I end up in, in Indiana. So I was born in Brazil, and my wife was born in Poland, and she lived in Warsaw. So I'll tell you that if I give you this information, and if you know about Indiana, why is that we chose Purdue? Uh, that uh, should be obvious why. So if you look here at the map of Indiana, which I took from uh, Google Maps, if you look here on the north, there is Warsaw. <laughs> and if you look, of course, on the south, uh, next to Terre Haute, what do you find? <laughs> Brazil. So Purdue is right in the middle, right? So if you have two families, <laughs> right? So that's the place where you can live. That's, there's no problem. We are you know, about halfway. So then uh, my wife and I found out that we've been, uh, after all, from Indiana. The only foreign people at home are the children. They were born in California. <laughs> so that's why they speak with an accent. <laughs> okay, so uh, to uh, tell you about the, uh, uh, 
the uh, career, I guess uh, I will start uh, talking about the faculty tasks. Of course, if you are a faculty member, you know that you know, they, they give us uh, uh, tasks you, you're supposed to teach, you do service, uh, and you do research. So I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about those, uh, those three uh, tasks. Uh, the first one is, is uh, uh, teaching. And, and uh, I'm not sure if uh, you know, but Purdue uh, in uh, chemical engineering is usually top uh, one to three uh, largest department in the country. So usually it's not, cannot be, sometimes it's not number one, but it's for a few, two, three percent of the, of, the, of the number one. So we are consistently over the years one of the largest departments of chemical engineering in the country. So that means that we have, uh, just by being a professor here, you have a, a large uh, effect on the uh, uh, chemical engineering. Uh, so I, I, I imagine, that difficult to count how many, but probably about a thousand undergrads that uh, have been able to uh, uh, teach in the various courses. And in the graduate program, we are probably around number five or so in the country, so also a very large uh, uh, program. So being, just by being here, you have a, a, a large opportunity to uh, uh, contribute into the lives of, uh, and how the uh, profession of chemical engineering goes. The other task is, is service, right? So as you, uh, our, our professional uh, society is the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, that's the main one. And in, in, in my case, because the research is so related to chemistry, also the American Chemical Society, it's mostly volunteer work so we spend uh, quite, a, quite a bit of time making sure that the, uh, the, uh, the profession goes into the right direction, that uh, uh, what we think is important uh, gets uh, 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 taught and, and spread. Uh, then there is uh, our own uh, particular uh, uh, profession, which is, uh, uh, in my case, is catalysis. And then we have to collaborate, or, or we do collaborate very much in the local, there are local societies, there are national societies, and there's international societies that we make sure that the, uh, uh, this area of, of, uh, that we are in uh, progresses uh, uh, as uh, we think it should. And then there is uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, th uh, third one, because we, uh, we publish our work and uh, we write grants, the, the reviewing process is, is, uh, takes uh, uh, quite a bit of, of time. Is, this is all mostly uh, volunteered work, uh, work, but recently I've, I've uh, been involved in also editorial uh, uh, work, which is, uh, I'm an associate editor of uh, journal catalysis, and now I had the opportunity to uh, teach people in a global base. So people send the, their, their papers into the journal, and then we have the opportunity to communicate with those people and tell them this is how it should be done and of course, I, uh, as an editor, you have the, the final word on what gets published, what doesn't. So you have a, a, a role into shaping how uh, research should be done uh, and influence uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, my, my main field, which is uh, catalysis. And then uh, there is uh, research, right? So this is the, uh, the, the large one. This is the one that takes almost all the time. And the reason for that is to uh, get the students the, the opportunity for them to be in the lab and get paid and have all the equipment that, that they want and do the, the research that uh, they want. Usually, you, you graduate students probably don't realize that, how much uh, work it takes to, uh, for you just to go into the lab and never worry about money. You just go there and can run your experiments. And in the case of my students, they are spoiled. They, they have all the equipment just for them. When I was a graduate student, I had to share they don't, they have their own and all the equipment and usually they are just limited by, by, by their ideas. So that takes up uh, 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 most of, uh, of our time. So the, uh, you have to do the other service and teaching with the, uh, the, the time. But the interesting part of this is that the teaching at the top, it, which is really the most important, all the rest are just enablers, but to enable teaching is very important to, uh, to be able to, to, to do the research. So, this year, there will be 25 years that I finish my, my PhD. So if I had not been involved with industry and with the societies and talking to colleagues and seeing how the profession is, is, is moving, I wouldn't be able to, uh, with confidence, to teach the students, this is what you, you need to learn. I know it because I work in, in, with industry. I know what they're using. This is what you need to learn. 
but the, uh, the uh, enabling, enabling part uh, 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 for that is, is very large. And, and I think people confuse that our objective really is, is on research because we spend so much time in it, but it's not. It's just to enable the, uh, uh, the best teaching uh, uh, we can do. So with that then, since I gave you the, uh, the faculty tasks, then I'm going to tell you how do you accomplish all those things, of course, my, my opinion. So I think you need, uh, uh, I think you need to uh, have uh, three components there. Uh, you have to first uh, sat satisfy your, your heart. You need to have something that you can, you're able to, uh, to, uh, to perform by uh, uh, having a family. So the family is very important. But then there is a second family, which is give you all the ideas and the collaborations. And without that, uh, with an environment to collaborate, you can't do much. Um, and then, of course, there are the, uh, the, uh, the real people that actually can do all those things, uh, which is, becomes our uh, academic family. So then, then there are three families that are important to accomplish those, uh, those three tasks. So here are the uh, uh, first uh, family. So I'm showing that to you not to uh, tell you that I have uh, noticed that I can have some other outfit than, than uh, this one. <laughs> But I'm showing that to you because our family is, is hardcore Boilermakers. So our daughter uh, graduated 2012 in chemistry. Our son is in electrical engineering. He's uh, going to be a senior soon. And uh, my wife uh, is, uh, studies in the uh, human development and uh, family studies. So everyone is, is uh, at Purdue. So that means that those are the people I love the most. Right? So I tell them I want the best for them. And the best for them to me is I know it's Purdue. So that uh, means that they are all hardcore boilermakers. So then, then there's the, uh, the second family, which is, uh, uh, I wanted to make a, a point here that the way that uh, we, we structure our group is, uh, our, our research is to make a group. And uh, the reason we do that is, is, I told you about research, the competition outside is, is really very large. So to be able to compete, we need to have a group of people that complement each other and make a really group, uh, strong group that's much stronger than, uh, than, the, than the parts. So um, uh, we were able then to, uh, uh, with the help of the College of Engineering that understood that it's very important to hire people on, on, on teams. In fact, there is, uh, the uh, dean now has a, a, a program called preeminent teams. So if you have a good idea, of, you want to get together and uh, have an idea of a, a team that you together can do much better, then uh, there is a special program that allows you to hire people. So this is uh, uh, with the help of the, of the college and, and our school we're able to uh, hire all, all those people. Uh, so then together we can make a, a, a team that I think it's, it's unmatched. Uh, but this, uh, this idea is, is relatively new. So uh, we assembled this, this team only, uh, the, I guess the last member came only uh, in, in, in August so that we have uh, uh, people in, in, uh, in all the areas so that we can uh, uh, really make a difference. And we hope that uh, we'll see that in, if in about five years of this group working together, we're going to make a real difference. So uh, we, we, we really hope so. And, and of course, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the person that started all this, that's the, uh, the, uh, the star and that puts all together is, is Nick Delgas. He's the one that started all this and that uh, were able to put all this, uh, this group together. So now here's the, uh, the, uh, the uh, third family. So this is, uh, those are the, uh, the people that I tell you that I, I really am, I'm, I'm here for. I spend almost all my time. My students think that uh, they work for me. It's, it's the other way around. I work for them. And they push me very hard <laughs> to, to do things for them. So th this is a list of the students that already graduated. They, they are uh, in industry. You can see that they are work for the major uh, uh, corporations. They are doing extremely well. Uh, really proud of uh, what, what they do is, and as I mentioned to you, this, in the end, this is really what I, uh, uh, the objective of the, uh, uh, our work here is, is for. And, and of course, uh, there are my uh, superstar uh, current students. There is Alba and Harsh and Yaran, Victor, John, Mike, uh, McKay, Amir, Jamie, Jen Long, Daria, Atish, Shankali, Juan, Caivalha, Arthur, Ian, 
Fred, uh, Hunting, Vinod, and Anush. So this is an amazing uh, group of, of people. Of course, uh, I, I should tell you that none of them are only my students. They are at least co-advised by an, an, another one. So all of them are co-advised by Nick Delgas, and some of them also co-advised by Rakesh Agrawal. So we have at least, uh, well, some of them have uh, three advisors, and uh, there is why there are uh, so many people. So, so then I, I told you that with those uh, three people, uh, uh, or those three families, right? So this is how we can uh, 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 do the work we do. So then uh, now comes to the, uh, the part about uh, the uh, technical talk, right? So my, my area is, is called uh, uh, heterogeneous catalysis. So first I should tell you uh, why, why it's important. Uh, you, you, you can read uh, there, but if you use a car or a truck, you have uh, one or multiple catalysts, and the fuel that goes into your car passes probably about five catalysts before it gets into the uh, fuel tank, and all the plastics you use, and most of the chemicals, uh, and any new technologies uh, that, that come up, if you think about renewables, and you, know, you need all kinds of catalysts, and so it's, it's, a, it's an area that's uh, uh, very important, it's central to the economy, and it's gonna continue to be for, uh, for the foreseeable future. So um, then uh, there is the name uh, heterogeneous catalysis. And so the name heterogeneous is not because of the materials are so heterogeneous, which they are, uh, but the uh, name for heterogeneous comes from the fact that the, uh, the catalyst that you can see here, I have a picture there, but you can see the, uh, the catalyst here that actually goes into a huge reactor. They are little, uh, those little balls and those little balls, they have a surface, a very high surface area. So typically 300 square meters per gram. So that means that if I would fill my hand with uh, those uh, little uh, balls here, I'd have more area inside those balls than in this whole room. And that's where the, uh, the, all the chemistry goes, on the surface of the, of the catalyst. So catalysis has to do with the uh, surface. But to be able to have such a high surface area, the only way you can do it is you have to have very small pores. So this solid that I, that I, I worked to you, showed to you on, on those little balls, they're actually very porous. And those pores, uh, to be, have such a high surface area, the, uh, they are of the uh, diameter of a few nanometers. So you can, you can see here, uh, the, uh, on here, uh, depiction of, of, of the pores, and you see those blue particles there. So this, this white stuff that you see, we call it a support. It's just usually an oxide, high surface area, very uh, robust. Uh, uh, you can take it to high temperatures and it's very stable. And usually on that, we, we deposit what we call the catalyst, which could be a metal. And with this metal, you can see that there's some little dots. We add uh, a few more things that then make the, uh, the catalyst uh, uh, what it is. And so people in industry, they love that because that uh, high surface area material is cheap. You can buy that on tons. And some reactors, they, they take hundreds of tons of, of that stuff and it comes in railroad cars to, to, to be uh, loaded into the, uh, the, the reactor. So they, they're cheap. And uh, because if they have a very high surface area, you can have a very high productivity, right? Because you have a very high surface area, the amount of gas or liquid you can pass is, are enormous. So you can have a reactor that's relatively small and has a very high uh, productivity. And that means you know, very high uh, uh, profit. And so it's a profitable way of uh, producing uh, chemicals. So industry, of course, loves those, those uh, type of materials. But then the problem with that is, is that uh, because of this porous material and this very high concentration of active sites, and usually, uh, as you know, reactors, uh, reactions can uh, be exothermic or endothermic, there is heat transfer, there is mass transfer. Uh, so then, uh, uh, although this is mostly chemistry, and this is actually heterogeneous catalysis, is really physical chemistry, you have to think about the transport processes, you have to think about the kinetics, and you have to have a, build all this into a reactor. So he, he, he needs, you need to think about how the conversion is gonna go, and so there is all this math uh, uh, that's uh, applied, and usually our uh, friends in chemistry, they, they don't like that. I mean, all this mass transfer, heat transfer, and reactor modeling, we don't like it. So by tradition in the United States, usually the heterogeneous catalysis is in, is in the chemical engineering department, although the core which is where the reaction really happens, which is what we are interested in. It's all uh, physical chemistry, but 
to be able to get into the chemistry, you have to first uh, make sure that you have all the trans transport and, and things out so that you, you think only about the kinetics. And for this reason, I'm going to show to you what we call a model catalyst. And sometimes instead of having this complication of having this high surface area, we put the catalyst on a flat surface. So it's, everything is exposed. And then we put the oxide and we put the particles on top. And now everything is, is exposed. And then it's, it facilitates the way we, we, we do all the chemistry. And once we do all this, then we can uh, understand how the chemistry works. And then we connect back into the, uh, the engineering side, which is usually we don't do. Our partners in industry usually uh, do that part. So the uh, uh, next. Uh, well, then uh, I, I'll tell you that uh, the, our life is to connect the structure of the catalyst, which is usually clusters. You, you, this is a uh, real uh, uh, transmission electron microscopy of a, of a platinum cluster. You can see all the, the atoms there. And you can see the, sh the shape of the particle and how to relate that structure with the actual performance that we see on our reactor. That's what we, we measure. So our life is to go from sub nanometer all the way to a real reactor that has you know, a few, few meters. So we try to correlate those, those, those things. So this is uh, the idea of our, of our research. So next, I'm going to tell you how a, a, a catalyst works. And instead of telling you that, I'm going to actually make a demonstration. Uh, so this is uh, our student, uh, uh, Victor Chibuski. Uh, so Victor is, has been here with us. Uh, he's that's his, uh, entering his third, his third year. He uh, worked uh, in uh, industry uh, uh, before, uh, and he uh, uh, uses this demonstration. We go, he goes around Indiana as part of our NSF grant to uh, talk to kids about chemistry and chemical engineering. And so this is a demonstration that, that, that he does. So what uh, uh, this is, is a, it's a small chemical plant. So here you have an oxygen, a tank of pure oxygen. Here you have a tank of pure hydrogen. And so those uh, two gases, uh, we, uh, like in a chemical plant, we, we control them. We, we uh, decrease the high pressure to a lower pressure. Then we have a mechanism that we can flow those, uh, those two components. And then the gases mix. And then they come here at the, uh, at the, uh, the front. And uh, so, you, so, you, so you can make a, a, a little uh, bubble here. This is just uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, Victor was complaining that uh, the, there is a bottle there of uh, soap bubble that was our children when they were young that played with that. It's just the solution to make a, a, a soap. Uh, uh, and so this is a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen stoichiometric. And so this, uh, this you can play with that. And uh, you can, uh, trust me, you can stay here all day playing with that hydrogen and oxygen. Nothing happens. So then uh, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens uh, if you now uh, put up platinum, so which is the catalyst we're going to be uh, talking about. So this is uh, 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 what's called platinum black, which is a just pure platinum, high surface area. And uh, you, you, the, uh, the color is not like the one that, that you use in your, in your, in your jewelry, but it's, it is uh, all uh, black. Uh, and so now you're making a, a, a bubble there. And then you see what happens when, when you put a uh, 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 platinum close to it. <laughs> so, so this is what the uh, 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 catalyst does. So hydrogen and oxygen, they, they, they don't react spontaneously, although they want, really want to, uh, to react. No, nothing happens. So, and, and the reason for, uh, for that, if, if you usually the way you look at that, if you look at the energy versus the reaction coordinate when the hydrogen and the oxygen want to, to, to react, you, you have here the, uh, the uh, reactants, uh, oxygen and hydrogen, they have high energy, they have a high potential energy. And here you have water uh, way down. So the, those two molecules are dying to go from here to, to, uh, to uh, there. So this is what we call uh, you need, if you want to, to carry out a chemical reaction and you want to produce something in, in uh, uh, enough uh, uh, yield, you need to have that happening. The products want to have form. In other words, the equilibrium needs to be into the side of the products, which in this case, forming water from hydrogen and oxygen is all the way to the, into the water. There's, 
if you if you look at the equilibrium, the hydrogen and oxygen, you wouldn't have a technique that could detect the uh, the equilibrium because they are so small. But if you have the just the hydrogen and oxygen together, the molecules have a very strong bond, so they can't react because the uh, the, the bonds are just very strong. You, you have to break one of the bonds first. Now, because this, this reaction releases heat, once you break a bond, they, they release so much heat that the heat passes into the other molecules and the reaction goes. But until that happens, you can't have it. But when you put a catalyst, in fact, you don't change any of the thermochemistry. The amount of heat that's released with a catalyst and without a catalyst, if you had put a match there, for example, to have exploded too, it's, it's the same. But what the catalyst does is provides a path that you can see in terms of energy. You don't need to push the molecules so much energy for, for them to, to go and react uh, with, uh, with a, 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 uh, a catalyst. So the, the way that the catalyst works in, in that particular case, platinum at room temperature, they, it absorbs oxygen and hydrogen at room temperature and dissociates the, uh, the, the molecules on the surface. So, and this is a, a path that for the platinum is very easy, easy to do. It's a very unique metal, it can, it can do that. Once those uh, uh, atoms now, they dissociate on the surface and they are also very close together. They are much closer together than, than they are in the gas phase. And now those molecules are very close together and then they react. And so then you form water and then eventually the water then, uh, water doesn't stick into, into the platinum, the water dissorbs and now you have the, the metal again that can again absorb uh, hydrogen and oxygen and then the, the, uh, the cycle can, can go over and over. So uh, just to, uh, to explain to you what happened there, uh, when you put the, uh, the, the platinum in, what happened there is that this reaction that you, sh you show here in this cartoon started happening. And when this reaction happens, it generates a lot of heat. And so what caused the, uh, the, the explosion was that the catalyst got very hot. And uh, when the catalyst got very hot, it just acts like a match. And then uh, the, the very hot uh, uh, catalyst, most of the reactions you saw, they occur actually in the gas phase. And so that reaction uh, uh, was a chain reaction and not related to the catalyst. The catalyst just initiated the, the reaction. If you were going to do that in a chemical industry, of course, you wouldn't use stoichiometric, but we do that reaction all the time to get rid of hydrogen if you want. You can put on a catalyst, and the catalyst does that, and then you dilute the, uh, the mixture so that you can do it safely. So, but then there is, there is an, another use. Of course, uh, you, you heard about fuel cells, right? So this is, uh, if people would have a way of uh, putting hydrogen into a car, for example, that would be uh, uh, safe and, and uh, economical, you can use that same reaction, but you separate them in, in what's called a, a uh, fuel cell. So there's a membrane that separates the hydrogen and the oxygen. It's called a, pr uh, pr a proton exchange uh, membrane, and then on the anode, on a catalyst, which is the same catalyst you saw, the platinum. You put the platinum on, on one of the anodes, the hydrogen dissociates. And then on the other anode, you put the, uh, again a, 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 another catalyst and it dissociates the, the, uh, the oxygen. And then the hydrogen passes through, through the membrane. Uh, and then with that uh, uh, electrochemistry, there is a flow of electrons that you can pass and you can use that to, to generate electricity. So, for example, if you, uh, uh, I mean, fuel cells are used uh, in many places. This is a, uh, an expensive fuel cell, but for example, if you go, if you do uh, space travel, right, all the, the spaceships, that's what they use. They have a tank of hydrogen, they have a tank of oxygen, liquid, and then uh, they use that to, uh, to generate electricity that they use on their, on, on, their, on their station, right? So the space station, of course, uses uh, solar, but for the space shuttle, when, when they were flying, the, all the, the power that they, they generate are, are generated on, uh, on that. So uh, uh, Victor is going to turn that, uh, that same setup. We're going to turn into uh, uh, just the, uh, the, uh, the two gases. Now, instead of going into and making a bubble, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go into a, f uh, uh, a fuel cell. The fuel cell is right here. Uh, if, if after the uh, talk, if you want, you can, you can take a look. Uh, there is the, f the cell here. There is hydrogen in one side, oxygen in, in the other side. And uh, when the, those uh, two components uh, combine, instead of having that explosion, you, you have the energy coming out as uh, electricity. So then uh, that's, uh, that's what you see there. So then I explained to you what uh, catalysts are uh, in a, a somewhat uh, dramatic way. <laughs> 
Uh, and so, but but in, in in terms, this is this is what we do in our lab. That same uh, reaction that you saw there, and things going to a surface, and without that, nothing happens. And you put a catalyst, things happens, right? So this is what why why what catalysts do, and that's why people use uh, uh, catalysts. And so now I'm going to tell you about uh, then uh, a specific example. I'm going to show you only one, to 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 give you an idea of what is it that uh, that we do for our for our research. And this has to do with, uh, with engines. Uh, and uh, more than that, it has to do with emissions, right? So if you have an engine nowadays and you want to sell it, it needs to pass emission controls. And the emission controls are very, very strict. So let me, let me tell you a, li a little bit about uh, 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 how the engine of an automobile work, right? So this is a gasoline engine. And this is a complicated graph. So I spent some time explaining to you what this is. This is the air to fuel ratio that you feed into the engine. So you have a, a number here that passes on the, in the x axis. And uh, one of the uh, uh, labels you can see here is the amount of oxygen that's going onto the stream of the car. So if you use a, an engine that's, uh, that's what, what we call rich, that has more oxygen, less oxygen than you need for the combustion, of course, so you use all the oxygen in the exhaust. There'll be no oxygen left, so it would be this case. And if you have a car that has a excess oxygen, then there'll be oxygen uh, coming out. Why is that important? That it's important, well, there, there is emissions. But right now, the, in addition to emissions, if you look at this line here, which is the fuel consumption, you see that a car that works uh, uh, rich, which has excess fuel, uses a lot of, uh, it's going to use much more fuel. If you look here at the, uh, it's, it's about the 100% uh, line than a car that would be very lean. So actually, a car that would be lean could go from point A to point B and uses a half of the amount of fuel that uh, it's uh, a, a car that uses uh, a lot of fuel. It's not because you're wasting fuel. It's just because the way that the, the efficiency of the, of the engine, it's the efficiency of the, of the cycle of, of, the, of the engine. So it's a thermodynamic problem there with people that design engines. You can't go out of it. So why is that people then obviously don't, uh, don't sell cars here? I will tell you, this is your car right here. So the reason for that is because of emissions. So there are three reactions, and that's why you see the name there, three-way catalyst. There is hydrocarbon oxidation, that's CO oxidation. Those are oxidation reactions. That means I need excess oxygen. But there is one reaction that's uh, NOx reduction. So there one, you don't need oxygen. I want to take oxygen out. I don't want excess oxygen. So if you are on the left side on the rich curve, of course, you cannot do the, uh, the oxidation reactions. You can do very well the rich reactions. And if you are on the right, you can do very well the oxidation reaction, but you can't do the reducing reaction. So just like the way that I showed you on that first map that uh, Warsaw in Brazil, so what do you do if you have two people opposite, right, doing different things, or you stay in the middle, right? If you stay stoichiometric, about stoichiometric, then you can do both reactions. You can do oxidation and you can do reduction. If you're just there, just right. So that's why a gasoline engine in a car is so complicated. It has sensors everywhere, and when you press on the accelerator, the car decides how much gasoline it's going to give so that you be just right so that your car will not have emissions. But then you pay a huge penalty on, on efficiency. So the problem here is, uh, is uh, to work in, in this part. Oxidation is no problem. You can do hydrocarbon and CO oxidation. It's the NOx reduction under excess oxygen. So if you invent a catalyst that can take NO to nitrogen and oxygen, and again, it's just like I showed here to you. There is NO here, and you want to make nitrogen and oxygen. All you need is, a, is a put a swab, the catalyst, and put on the NO. You should see an explosion and form N, NO and O2. But nobody could ever find out what this catalyst is. It should be possible. So laws of thermodynamics says, yes, you should be able to do it. But the kinetics, we can't find it. If you find it, you'd be richer than Bill Gates. Every car and truck would use your catalyst. And so anything that uses combustion, you use your catalyst. You would be incredible. So this is one of the problems, holy grail in catalysts. If you could find out what this magic catalyst should be, it would be great. So, this is, in a sense, the, uh, uh, the uh, problem that uh, we, are, we are working on uh, or, or helping. This is, uh, we work with Cummins. Cummins is the largest manufacturer, independent manufacturer of diesel engines. And, and the diesel engine, as opposed to a gasoline engine, you can't change the air to fuel ratio. It works only lean. You have to have access. So those guys, they have no 
no way of getting rid of the NOx like the cars do. So they have to have a different solution, uh, which, is, which is then uh, uh, what is, is coming next. How to get rid of the NOx in a diesel engine? If you cannot, there's no way of uh, taking the oxygen out. Uh, uh, a diesel engine spills out about 10% oxygen in the exhaust, and your car has almost no oxygen coming out, on, uh, out, out, of, the, uh, out of the pipe. So very different uh, ways that they, they operate. So uh, the, uh, what's called the, uh, the, the three-way catalyst doesn't work, and then what's used is it's what's, what's called a lean knock strap. And so you, I, I'll show you wh wh what it is to you. You may think it's a pretty crazy idea. So the NO that comes out of the car reacts with oxygen on platinum, makes uh, NO2. NO2 is a very oxidant gas, very reactive. So that gas reacts with uh, which say storage. It's a stoichiometric reaction. goes only once and stops. And so when the people are dri driving trucks, some type of truck, uh, the, the, uh, the, NO, the NOx is getting stored. But of course, you would be able to, to, to drive only about 20 miles, and then your storage is, is, is completely filled. So what you need uh, to do, and then uh, they send a command into, into the engine, then uh, you make the, uh, the mixture re uh, uh, reductant for a few seconds. You know, here is, here is the times. They, they run lean 60 to 9 seconds and reach 3 to 5 seconds. And when that happens, then you form reductants that then uh, uh, release the NOx. It goes back into the platinum, and some, some magic, you get nitrogen and oxygen out. So, um, uh, so it's a, it's a cyclic, uh, multi-step uh, process. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the first one. There are many steps. And then uh, I'm going to talk, be talking to you about the first step. It's called NO oxidation. And this is the one that uses platinum. And of course, platinum is, if you think about using platinum in a truck, the truck is very large. You'd have to put a guard around it. There's so much platinum on, on the catalyst. So of course, the, the, uh, the catalyst would be worth more than, than, than the truck. So it's not commercial. So, the amount of platinum that, that, that you're going to use is, uh, is very important. So you may think that this is a crazy idea, but if you look at the Dodge Rams that work on a Cummings engine, and you have uh, lots of those uh, uh, around. Some people take the, uh, the muffler out and make, they make a very annoying noise. But, uh, but the, uh, the, uh, the, the truck they uses, they uses this technology that, that I, I just told you. It's a very complicated, but they, they, those people at, uh, on the uh, uh, Callus companies, they, they, they made it. Uh, made it work. So I'm going to tell you, this research that I'm going to tell you then is, uh, has to do with the oxidation of NO. So you take NO plus oxygen, you make NO2 on platinum. And so uh, the problem with the, uh, the people in the chemical industry, they want to find out how that, uh, how that works. So um, uh, uh, how do we do this, this kind of research? So if you look at this equation here in red on top, right, very simple. So we assume that the rate uh, uh, it has a, what's called an Arrhenius uh, uh, dependence on temperature, and then it depends on a very simple way, uh, what we call a power rate law, on, on, the, on the three components, which is the two reactants and the product. So then we go into the lab, and then we measure the, the rate as a function of the temperature, and you plot, and you get a, should get a straight line. And uh, you will see this, uh, the, the way that uh, we talk about rates in heterogeneous catalysis, we say the mo number of molecules that were uh, converted, divided by the number of sites uh, on the catalyst, which is a difficult thing to find out what it is. But if we can, we divide number of molecules per site per unit of time. So molecules per site cancels out. The unit of the uh, rate is, is inverse uh, time. So in this case, inverse seconds. So this is the unit that we use, we normalize. And so if you really understand catalysis, uh, a particular system, then you'll be able to go to the lab, you measure the number of active sites, and then you can tell exactly, if I know the rate, I can tell exactly how that catalyst is going to behave. So then here you see the dependence of the rate on temperature, which is this part of the equation. In this part of the equation, I want to find out what those coefficients A, alpha, beta, and gamma are. Then you plot the log of the rate versus the log of the concentration. Keep the temperature constant. And so we find those, uh, those orders. And so just to give you an idea, we spend a lot of time uh, uh, doing those kind of measurements. And it's, the catalyst is porous. And you have to make sure that there is no transport limitations. And 
or, or temperature limitations that you're measuring the real rate. And, and so we, we spend a lot of time uh, thinking about those, uh, how to carry out those uh, measurements. And then, uh, then we, uh, we, uh, we dream, like uh, uh, Nick Delgas and I, we, that's what we like to do. We, so once we, have, uh, we know what the orders are, we say, ha, ah, now let's see if we can find out what the, what the catalyst is doing. And then we, we, we dream, say, well, probably NO adsorbs on the catalyst. The star there means an active site. We don't know what that is. We call it a star. And then the NO2 also adsorbs on, 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 the, uh, on the side. This is not an elementary step, but this is an overall step. And, and we think that those things are in equilibrium because they're so fast that they are in equilibrium. And then we say, ah, and then the oxygen, then now it has a problem adsorbing on this side. And this is what we call the rate determining step. That's, that's where all the energy of the reaction goes. It's the, the step that uh, consumes all the free energy to, uh, to happen. And so we think that that's what that reaction is. Uh, and then instead of writing equilibrium, we write uh, an equation like this. And then we also say that oxygen is the most abundant surface intermediate. Uh, and then we have a rate like this. And then uh, if we assume that we have a high oxygen coverage, this, this coefficient here on the bottom disappears. And then we have a, uh, an expression like this. And we are all happy and say, ha. We, uh, we got it because uh, experimentally that's what we, we measure. We say first order, first order, and minus one, and that's what this equation is. And you say, ah, we probably understand what things go, go on. And so, I, I, in fact, I chose this particular problem to show to you because that's the one that the numbers are very nice and round. So the others are so complicated, I'll have to spend a lot of time explaining to you why they are, they are complicated. In, in, usually, there is a denominator here that you can't get rid of, this, this guy. And in this case, we can because oxygen absorbs so strongly. So, so then we are very happy. And, and this is what uh, it, it's the core of, of, of our research. So you, you saw the, uh, the, the title of, of, of the talk. It's uh, uh, kinetics of heterogeneous catalytic processes. So that's, 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 that's what we do. And we use that to understand what the catalyst does. Now, for people that are in industry, right, they, they ask us, so uh, platinum is very expensive. So tell me, how do I get a better catalyst? So here is a test that, that, that we do. We call sintering. We take a fresh catalyst, and then we, we uh, heat it up at different temperatures. And then we look at the relative rate, right? This we call turnover rate. And you see that the old catalyst is better. It's like us, right? We got older, got better. So unusual. And so you tell the company, oh, so here's what you do. If you want a better catalyst, you just center it. But there's a problem. And the problem is here. There's something that we call dispersion. Dispersion means the amount of platinum that's on the surface versus the, divided by the total amount of platinum. So if I have a, a dispersion like the one of 61%, that means I'm using 61% of the platinum. And then a good catalyst uses only 6% of the platinum. So they can't use it because only... 6%, all the rest of the platinum is doing nothing. It's just being, making a big particle. They said, no, this is, we don't want that. We want to understand why is that uh, when you have a, a, a catalyst that has a low dispersion, uh, it, works, uh, it works much better. So it's not a good news for them because I'm telling them if you want something better, it needs to be big, big platinum. Big platinum is very expensive. So let me, let me explain to you what happens when, uh, when you have big particles, there's something happening. That has to do with the particle size. Once they, if the dispersion is small, that means that the particles are very large. And why is the correlation between the size of the particle and the catalytic activity? Well, it turns out, I'll show to you in more details very soon, that if you take a look at the catalyst in detail, they, have, uh, uh, they are made out of clusters. They, they look like a, what we call a cube octahedron. And they have some special sites. So here are the uh, usually what we call surface sites, just anything on the surface. But they have special things like the perimeter sites that they touch the support. And the coordination number of these sites, if you pay attention, they are lower because th they don't have anything below them. And especially corner sites, those are especially low. So you have all kinds of different sites on a particle. But it turns out that the fraction of those sites depending on the size of the particle. So if you take uh, this graph here, it, it's, it indicates for gold, but could be any, any metal. If you plot the uh, number of, of sites, for example, surface, uh, here would be um, uh, perimeter, and here would be corner atoms. 
as how they vary as a function of the particle size. So you see that the, uh, the, uh, this is d to the minus 7. This you cannot see it probably, right? But it's d to the minus uh, almost uh, uh, 1, uh, 2, and this is d to the minus 3. Th that's the way it varies. So that means that if you take any particle in a, in a certain size, the fraction of uh, uh, total atoms versus corner atoms versus perimeter atoms are different. And we know that the, uh, the binding energy of the molecules, right, which is what we, we are talking about, the molecules absorb, there's some energies involved. That energy depends on, on, the, on the number of those corners, of, of those special sites. And, and those special sites depending on the size of the particle. So that's why particle sizes are so important. But for us, it's, it's, it's about, uh, they have to be about, uh, Zero to five nanometers is uh, one to, f to five nanometers. Or you, you, you usually cannot, very difficult to get things below one nanometer. But one to five nanometers is where all the uh, changes happen. After that, the, uh, the fraction of uh, those special uh, sites are, are very small. It's mostly surface. If the particles are very large, it's, it's usually what's called the one, one, one planes in the case of FCC metals. And they, they, the atoms like to pack. And the ones that are cornered, the special sites, are very few in between. So that's why particle size and rates are, are, are very important. So then uh, uh, the, one of the hallmarks of, of our work is, is uh, uh, experimental methods. So we developed a special uh, methods. So we didn't invent this, this technique, but we had to invent ways of preparing catalysts that are non-porous, crystalline, has enough surface area. And, and of course have the same area as the, as the regular catalyst. And the reason for that is that we use them for particle size distribution and also for, for, for particle shape. For looking at those things, we can see what the shapes. And here's just the examples of all, all kinds of, of materials. You can see those beautiful TEM pictures, shape of the particles. You can see the atoms. And then we try to relate that, as you remember, the structure of those particles with the, what the catalyst does. So now let me show you some data. So we prepare a bunch of catalysts. Uh, the support that I mentioned to you, platinum and alumina, and, and on SBA15, which is silica. And then our conclusion was that I, we changed the, the particle size, but the kinetics, which is very important, how the reaction really goes, is all the same for all the catalysts. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's, as I told you, it's 1, 1, and minus 1 order. But the, uh, the rate, it's very dependent on the side on the size, so that doesn't make sense. If the catalyst itself, the energy, which means the reaction orders are all the same, how could then the, uh, the rate depends on the size? Because then if the kinetics is the same, all the sites are the same, but then if I normalize the rates per the total number of sites uh, on the surface, it doesn't correlate. They, they go way up. I mean, a, a very small catalyst could have uh, two orders of magnitude less active than a large one. So that's very bad news for people in industry. So they want to understand why. That makes no sense. The only way that, that can happen is that you don't know what the active sites are. We are counting. We are saying that all the sites are the, we are using the surface that I showed you. And obviously, that doesn't correlate. So there is something going wrong. And this is what we are, we are set to, uh, to find out. There was a hint. Uh, if, you, if you have a callus that, that, that works, so this is the rate as a function of time, it deactivates if they have about two nanometers. But then if you reduce the catalyst, it reactivates. So that means that there's something to do with oxidation of the, of the platinum. And then uh, there's a correlation between size and, and stability. The larger the particle, the more stable, the higher the rate. So maybe there is a, a correlation between deactivation and smaller particle size. And then to test that, then uh, as I mentioned to you, this is the hallmark of, of our group. What we really do to study uh, whatever problem, and, and each one is different. We build uh, uh, equipment. We're always building stuff. And so this one, we build a special cell, and, uh, and uh, it, it it's, it's looks in here. It's a, it's a reactor, but it has a little slit on the side. Uh, this is, in, this is in, in our lab, and this is at Argon National Lab. And what we do is we take that cell there, and we pass x-rays on those cells. The, cell, the x-ray passes right through the callus, the cells, and these x-rays probe what the, the callus is doing. And it tells us what's around the, uh, the, the callus. And it tells us what is the oxidation state under reaction conditions. So this is an absolutely incredible technique. This machine at, at Argon costs $5 billion to, 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 to build, about $300 million a year to, uh, to run. And so we are very fortunate. We're only two hours away. And so we get uh, usually 
five, six days uh, a year. We put everything on a van. You see this reactor here, we put in this. We put everything on a van, takes all to, to Argonne, stay there for two full days, uh, night and day. And then we get uh, 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 this type of, of result. So if you take those catalysts now into the Argonne National Lab, and if you look at the, at the fraction of the platinum oxidized as a function of time, so we put the, uh, the catalyst in there fresh, then we start flowing the mixture, and then we, we, uh, we, we have the x-ray analyzing what the catalyst does. Then we see that the, uh, the catalyst oxidizes, but ox oxidizes more as, as the particle size uh, increases. So this is what we, we, we had the suspicion that the large par uh, particles don't oxidize, the small ones do. So the activation then platinum oxidation. So the model that, that we have that could explain all the data is that the small particles that we can measure, they, they are always present when we measure all the platinum that's available. They are there, but as soon as you start the reaction, they, they get oxidized, they die. The large particles, because they have a, a platinum 111, it's so closely packed, they resist oxidation. They, they will eventually oxidize, but it takes time. And so while they don't completely oxidize and form platinum oxide, they are a good catalyst. So, then, uh, it, so the explanation for all this is very simple. So if you can keep your platinum from oxidizing, it's going to work fine. And so all you need to do is, 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 is find a way for your platinum not to oxidize. One way of doing that is to make a, a, a platinum very large. So again, to test this uh, idea, we, we developed a technique uh, in our uh, Berg Center. We have a very nice microscope. It's an environmental microscope. But the problem is that we want to run an experiment where we, we zero in into, a, into a one particle, which means a few atoms. And then, and then at uh, some time zero here, we change the concentration in the gas phase. But now, remember, you're looking at a few atoms. And if you change the concentration of gases at temperature and pressure, there is a variation in temperature, and then there's a drift, and then your particle just disappears. So then the trick is how to do that without, you can change the concentration in the gas phase and still look what's going on. So then, uh, then if I show you that into a TM picture for you, and I wanted to make a video of that, then uh, that's it. So we spend a lot of time on that. It works, but the problem is that the electrons, unfortunately, that comes on the microscope, they decompose the platinum oxides by themselves. So here's a technique that, uh, is very nice, but disturbs your system. So unfortunately, we spend a lot of time on this. Uh, I showed to you by x-ray absorption what the platinum does, but I, we couldn't do it by TEM. So this is one of the things. Sometimes we try, we fail. But uh, we can use this uh, technique for other uh, type of uh, systems. Well, uh, we're running out of time here. But the, uh, the other thing we do that's very different I wanted to show to you is that if this is all true, if the platinum 111 that resists oxidation is really what does the chemistry, we have the ultimate way of doing that. We can buy a one centimeter, instead of one 10 nanometers, one centimeter single crystal of, of platinum. So this is, this is what it is. It's mounted. And then we have a special system here that I can go to ultra high vacuum. It's 10 to the minus 12 bars inside that, that, that chamber. So we need that to prepare this very clean, very pristine crystal, and then we transfer that into a batch reactor that's at one bar, and, uh, and then we can measure the actual kinetics of a single crystal uh, sample. This is a, a technique that's really, uh, most people uh, don't like to do it because it's too much work, uh, and, and uh, uh, students that, 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 that work on that, they, they uh, struggle, but then when we get the results, they're, they're very clear what they are, and this is what the, uh, the unit looks like. This is the crystal here sitting inside, uh, and this is the, uh, the chamber that uh, has uh, 10 to the minus 12 bar. Usually we don't see that variation in pressures, right? Now you're doing research go going 12 orders of, uh, of, of uh, uh, magnitude. The, uh, the technologies that uh, require for you to, to uh, do that are very special, and that's what people usually don't do it. But we have Dima here at Purdue with us. That's why we can uh, do this kind of research here. So then what we do is, again, our favorite uh, measure, the uh, dependence of uh, concentration with uh, uh, rate with concentrations and temperature to make sure everything is okay. And then in the end, sure enough, uh, here is the, uh, the, that platinum particle that was very big, and this is the platinum 111 that I measure on this one centimeter versus 10 nanometers. They are the same. So we say, yes, uh, we, uh, we understand what's, what's going on. And then uh, in the end, as I told you, if you really know what you're doing, 
then the rate for all catalysts should be the same. So this is the same graph that I showed to you. This is the turnover rate per total moles of platinum on the surface, plotted as a function of the fraction of the platinum that's reduced under reaction conditions, which is a very difficult experiment to do, right? Because you have to find out what the catalyst is doing without taking it out of the medium. So if you, if you, if you do that, and you see, first of all, that uh, the size is not a descriptor. You have two catalysts here that have about the same particle size, completely different uh, behavior. The, the reason for that is that one is completely oxidized, the other one is not. So if you plot that as a function of platinum zero, then everything is, uh, f falls on, on, on the line. And so, in fact, uh, if you take the slope of this line, it's going to be, if you divide one, but one axis by the other, if you plot the number of moles per moles of platinum zero per second, the rate on every catalyst from the single crystal to the uh, uh, catalyst, which is, will be the slope of this line, will be the real rate, is the same for everyone. So then, then I think we explain what's going on. So uh, in, in this particular problem, if you have platinum, if you have small particles, they oxidize, then you cannot count how many of them, the, the, those active sites, that star, we don't know what, the, what, what it is. But if you do this, uh, use those special techniques, you can tell uh, what, what, what they are. Uh, then uh, I, I was going to tell you that there is another technique that, that we use. It's very cool. Uh, it's, it has only two in the world. One is in California. One is in Berlin. Beautiful places to go visit. So the students go there, stay about a week, and then the beauty of that is that actually you can measure the oxidation state on a single crystal as the reaction is going on. It uses synchrotron radiation. And then we, 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 I told you that on the surface is mostly oxygen. And so we can actually prove that we can run the reaction and show that on the surface, on the reaction condition, we can tell what the coverage is and how much is, is uh, uh, on the surface. Then uh, the last, uh, very quickly, uh, some, uh, we do all those, those experiments and we think about things, but sometimes the experiments are too complicated. Then we have to ask our theory guys to, to help us. When we were doing this work, Jeff Greeley was not here yet. We were working with people from uh, Notre Dame to help us on the, on the simulations. So this is, I told you, part of the team that now, now we have in place. And so we, with uh, uh, quantum um, uh, chemical calculations, we can find out what's going on. And without going into, into details, there are many types of uh, uh, mechanisms that, uh, that we can think about. And so the people in theory, we collaborate. It's a very important part uh, for our research. Uh, Purdue, by the way, has a very powerful uh, uh, computer center. The computers that we have here are wonderful. So it's uh, uh, something that's, uh, uh, that we rely very much uh, in terms of uh, our theory. So uh, with that, I'm, I'm going to stop here. Thank you for, for your attention. And then again, the message here is, is not celebration for, for, for the students. They are the ones that really we are here for and uh, to uh, celebrate them and to, to thank them. So uh, time for a few questions and I understand You can ask a general question about <laughs> if you want. <laughs> okay, we'll open it up. Yeah, go ahead. Um, oftentimes in catalysis, the quality is the active end. It's always a really expensive precious metal like black or gold or penny or something like that. Are there any ways to maybe go around the rise and be able to make better use of the common metals so that the cost of the metal have to be so high? Yeah, so this is a, a, a very good question. I'm not sure if everybody heard, but the question was that why you use those very, very expensive metals uh, on, on, uh, on, uh, on callus. Of course, they are very expensive because we don't find much of, of them. So if you're looking for platinum, in, in the case of platinum, for example, at one time, the sources were, of platinum were South Africa and uh, Russia. So the U.S. was really, at that time, the, the U.S. Uh, had the apartheid, was not talking to people from South Africa, real problem. So in fact, my PhD thesis was my advisor thought if you take tungsten carbide 
you can make it like behave like platinum. So that's what my, my PhD was, uh, to study that. How I could make a tungsten, that's a material that's everywhere, that could behave like, like platinum. So the, the, uh, the answer is, um, of course, people try that very hard, but it's very, very difficult to, uh, to really emulate, especially platinum. It, it does a metal that does wonderful things. Uh, that one that I showed to you, lots of metals will, will, will do it, but platinum is especially good. If you take palladium, it probably is going to fail and it's going to fizzle, not give that big bang. So you really need platinum. But um, the, one of the first catalysts, by the way, in the pe petroleum industry was platinum and aluminum. So this guy came, came up and, and told the management, I'm going to put platinum on a, on, a, on, a, uh, on a reactor, and I need 500 kilograms of it. So well, you're crazy, right? You're going to put platinum on, on our, how much that costs? Well, the cost is, is really very small because, in fact, uh, uh, refineries, they don't buy catalysts, they rent. You, 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 you talk to a company, they put that in your reactor, right? But it's a catalyst, it's not used. The catalyst is, is there, so you use, you use it, and when it sinters, you drop that out of the reactor, extract the platinum, and redeposit. So it is expensive, but it's, once you, you have it in place, you, you can use it forever and ever. So, uh, so that's, the, that's, how those, that's why those very expensive metals are used in industry, because the cost of the catalyst is very small compared to, to, to everything else. So there isn't really a drive to, to try to uh, 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 do that. But of course, on the cars, they also, it's the same metal. What I showed you here, here, in your car, if you take the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the catalyst, and in fact, uh, I hear that people now got into doing that, where they go under your car, take the catalyst out and go with that because it's, uh, it's expensive because of, of the metals. But again, you can recycle them uh, at, at the end. Uh, but, yeah, but, but this is a holy grail. I mean, what would be, a lot of our research, by the way, has to do with that. How to mix metal A, can you mix metal A and metal B, and by mixing them, make, make something that, that looks like a, a completely different metal. So can you mimic uh, by, by making, for example, alloys? And so we, people that do theory, they, they do a lot of that in trying to understand if by mixing things you can do, a, 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 let's say, a new material, right? Because you have only the periodic table. OK, anybody? Yeah, so, so, uh, so uh, again, uh, just to, to repeat the, uh, the question, uh, Professor Francis asked, uh, which is the question that everybody needle us about, right? You talk about this little star, but what is it? And so, and so even some people say, don't use that because we don't know what it is. And so we, do our, we make our best bet. Sometimes we just uh, measure the, the total surface that is exposed, and then you run reactions like we did, and we try to correlate. Uh, on all catalysts, if, if we can get a straight line, uh, a flat line, that means that we can really find that what star is, then the rate should be, when you normalize, should be the same for all of the catalysts. When it doesn't, it means that we don't know what the active site is. So that's uh, what helps us. We are always trying to find what the, 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 the active site is. For this particular reaction, uh, I didn't uh, talk about the, the details, but first of all, the catalyst, uh, I, I like to say that, that the, platinum, the catalyst is really not platinum. Platinum doesn't actually catalyze this reaction at all because platinum is, is, uh, absorbs NO and oxygen so strongly that they'll never, let, they'll never let go. What happens is that those molecules come to the surface, then they passivate the, the, the surface. Now the surface is not so active, doesn't bind so strongly. So the chemistry now happens on top of that surface. So it's not platinum, it's platinum with oxygen. That's the surface, the binding energy I didn't have a chance to, to show. Varies dramatically as the coverage changes. And the coverage changes as a function of reaction conditions. So even to answer your question, what's the active site? You say, well, maybe depending of, uh, of the reaction conditions, what is turning over will, will, will change. Uh, because the active site will, will change under reaction conditions. So, in this particular reaction, probably the corners, the most active sites, are absorbed so strongly that they are dead uh, on arrival. They never turn over. And so the, probably the sites that turn over are the ones that are on the surface, that are flat, and that have lots of oxygen around. But, you know, I, I, it, it's a valid criticism. What, but 
your, your question would be, but tell me what the active site really is. I, 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 we really don't know. There is no way of catching the molecule that we know yet uh, on the active site. So the, uh, the people that do theory, they, they tell us this is what probably is happening. And then we put all this data together that I showed to you, and then we have a model. And you say, well, from everything we know, it looks like the, uh, the active site is. But, but it also varies for, for, for different callus. Uh, in another chemistry that I, I didn't show to you on gold, the active sites are the corner sites. Those sites that bind strongly are the, ones that, the only ones that matter. All the others don't matter. In this chemistry, it's the other way around. It's the sites that, uh, that bind uh, weakly. So it, it, each problem is completely different. Then. Right. Well, great talk, Professor Ricardo. As usual, you convinced me that one, this is a very complicated subject, and two, you know more about it than just about anybody else in the world. Um, so I, I guess my big question always is, I guess I've asked your students, so I'm qualified exam, so I should ask you now as well. Um, you know a lot about these reactions, right? You know all the chemistry, very much, very beautiful. So then the engineer part. What can you do now that you know that much? How can you make it better? Is there a way to make this reaction better than you should have done? Can you engineer the materials in a new way? Can you change the nanotubes or something like that? Yeah, so. Uh so to follow up on, on, on your question, what I showed to you, right, so uh, maybe you wanted to know, I was talking about Cummings and, and this, this thing that they wanted a callus that's better, right? And I told you what you need, I told them what you need to do is make the particles large, but that's you know, senseless because then that means that the callus is going to be so expensive that nobody can afford. So then uh, now that we found all this, what can you do next, right? So uh, one idea would be, okay, if the platinum cannot oxidize, maybe you can make an alloy, put gold. Uh, maybe if you make a platinum gold alloy, maybe that alloy is not going to oxidize. Or maybe you make a, a, a system that has, uh, you know, you make something that, uh, that's large and you put only one layer of platinum on top. So then that one layer on platinum is it's all that, that you need and it's large and it's going to do the chemistry you, you want, right? So then all those, those, once you do this kind of research, there's all kinds of ideas that you can pass on. Right, and then uh, not only the, uh, the, uh, the engineers, but the material people, then we would need to have to uh, make the material. So that's why we need to have uh, in a group, you have to have somebody that's an expert in materials so that you, you give those uh, type of uh, uh, ideas to a person and say, oh, I know how to make a material. So if they can make the material for us, we can test, we can do all kinds of uh, characterization and see what's on the surface. But, but I'm not smart enough to, uh, 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 by the way, most of what I showed to you, I'm not smart enough to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to uh, do it myself. It, it should look very impressive because I, I can't do most of that. I have to have friends on the theory, the characterization that I, that I showed to you. I have to have experts to help us uh, understand on how to run those very complex experiments. The TEM, this is a person that does only that. I mean, and, and the, uh, the ultra high vacuum experiment, this is, uh, this is a really a team of, 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 of people and of course very talented students that can actually make those things uh, work out. So this is, uh, this is really not, not me. Uh, I'm just delivering, I'm just maybe the catalyst. <laughs> but I'm just delivering to you what other people uh, have, have done. And this thank Professor Rivera one more time.